Okay, so first of all, I want you to start thinking about your activities and commitments. And what I should say about the session is that we'll try and make it as interactive and engaging as possible. So if you've got any questions throughout the session, please let me know. Um, but with, there will be some sort of group activities as well. So there's other things here um, that aren't on the list. But when you talk about what are your commitments or what are your activities day to day, week to week, throughout the year, you've got your studies. Many of you have got your work or you want to get work, which is why you're here today. You've got social life, potentially, hopefully, maybe you know, out and about. Um, you've got family and friends, not all whom are here. They're in another country and you have to keep up to date with them and keep in communication with them as well. Um, networking opportunities, I'm going to touch on a bit because that's really relevant to working and studying. Um, hobbies and interests, so any sports that you're doing, any clubs or societies you might be involved in. You can come and sit at the front if you want, up to you, don't up to you. Um, and there's going to be a lot more there as well. So when you talk about work and study, life and things like that, you realise actually there's quite a lot of things that are going on. So the reason why I've brought this into the mix is because you can then manage your time to be able to work and study effectively. So one of the things that I found really, really useful um, was getting organised before I actually undertook the task of trying to balance work and study, especially if I was up in my hours. Um, so maybe not all of you are doing 20 hours, maybe you're looking for, um, maybe you're doing 10 and you want more as well. Um, but working out actually what do, you, what do you need to do in your weeks and what do you need to do in your yearly calendars as well. So it might sound really OTT, but I had a annual calendar on my wall at home with different coloured stickers. Green was social because it seemed like the green light, it was fun, I could go out. There wasn't many of them on there. Um, red was deadlines, yellow was lectures or seminars orange was some other work events or whatever it might be. But whatever commitments you've got, that helped me massively. So then you can start working out, okay, how much time do I actually have to commit to work and to commit to my studies? Are there any periods where I'm gonna be away that I need to re like think about if I'm going for employment or I need to let them know? Um, and above that is an example of a weekly schedule. So on top of my annual planner, I had a weekly schedule. So Monday to Sunday, I started 10, so about six, well, it kind of went from 6 a.m. to say 10 p.m. Um, obviously, you can you might work better late or earlier in the morning, um, but worked out actually where have I got my must-do activities in the week. So when are my lectures? So I had three lectures a week. So I knew six to nine was blocked out for three days a week. So I knew I couldn't commit to maybe an evening work, for example. In the daytimes, there might be different events that you've got going on or different commitments, hobbies and things like that that you don't really want to get rid of. And then you start getting a really clear picture of what your weeks are looking like and actually how much you can commit to. So you can then work out obviously how many hours you can commit to work. Um, as I said, you've got up to 20 hours, but maybe that might not be manageable. Maybe you're thinking actually I'm, I'm looking for something maybe five hours for three days, 50, you know, 15 hours a week, something like that. So by doing this first, you're actually one step ahead. Maybe if you're working already, you're thinking I'm a bit stretched, or maybe you're not. Maybe you could up your game in terms of voluntary opportunities to get a foot in the door somewhere else. So plan ahead, and I can share these slides uh, with Radhika at the end as well, so that you can refer back to them. Um, but just for now, um, just to kind of get us to get to know each other, I've tried to memorise all your names, but I won't repeat them all again. Um, I'm just going to split the team in two, just to have a discussion between yourselves, to actually talk through what are your commitments? Have you got hobbies? Are you working? How many hours a week do you need to study? Just to try and think, actually, oh yeah, then once a week I do this, or actually I want to do more volunteering. So just start to talk to the other people, only about five minutes, um, just so each of you get, a, get to have a say in terms of, these are my commitments now, these are the activities I'm doing, or maybe it's the activities you want to be doing, just to try and capture that already. So if we say, you four here, and then we've got a five here. So about five minutes, have a bit of a chat, um, and think about how you can obviously plan ahead with it, but it's mainly this kind of thing that you're talking about now, just to try and highlight what those commitments are and what those activities are that are in your week, weekly plans. Okay, off you go, you've got about five minutes. Okay, we're gonna start wrapping up the conversations there. Um, hopefully you've all had a think, um, if not a discussion about those. Um, so just a little bit of feedback, what kind of things were coming out of it? Obviously you, you've got work and study, but any interesting sort of conversations or other commitments that you guys have had? or that you have for this year? I think it's getting the work and study life balance. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you were saying over here on this group as well is, can I just check who's on a visa that restricts them to 20 hours per week? Yeah, so it's a challenge. That's something that we're going to be talking about is being quite savvy with our job searching um, and being quite 
um, I guess a bit curveball sometimes with trying to get opportunities in proper jobs, as you called it. Um, I did have a 10-year career history in uh, hospitality, and it was great. So it set my, set my um, career on the go. So if you are working in retail and hospitality, there's so many transferable skills that you can get. Um, so don't poo-poo them, but I completely understand that at certain stages in your career, you want to be getting a foot in the door to what you are actually studying towards and where you want your career to go. So we will touch on that as well. Um, and a couple of you, I think, are working, obviously, full-time if you haven't got those restrictions. The story of mine, I, I came yeah. three months ago, I'm hostess at this moment. Yeah. I work 40 to 45 hours per week, yeah. which is too much. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I thought that part-time studies would be fine to combine these things, but I understand that anyways, it's a bit too much if you want to do the qualitative studies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's nothing connected to my career, where I would be. Absolutely. And as much as I said I studied full-time and worked full-time, it's not something I would recommend. Um, it is crazy. Um, so yeah, so there are lots of things. So s some people have certain hours in the day. So if you're going to be spending that much time at work as well, you want it to be in something that you are passionate about and that it is going to go somewhere. Um, or if you are looking to get a part-time job alongside your part-time studies, then where can you look as well? Um, so you probably recognise a lot of the benefits of work and study, that's why you're here as well. But just to highlight, highlight some of the op other opportunities that it does bring you, um, obviously aside from getting a salary, which is obviously why we work, um, but it will develop your skills further. So broaden your horizons a bit, maybe think outside the box. If you're struggling to get something in the actual career or sector you want to get into, then think outside the box, take a step back and think, okay, actually, what skills do I need to develop and what other industries might be able to help me to get there? Because it might be that you do enter by a bit of a curveball way. It might not be a linear process. And actually, with the sort of job situation as it is going, there's so much flexibility and people are keen to get transferable skills to be able to transfer into other roles as well. So don't be put off. It's not sort of X plus Y equals Z. It's not always that linear. Uh, meet new people. And this focuses on the networking side that I'm going to come on to um, a little bit later. Um, but gain new knowledge and skills. So yes, everyone's got their strengths. You've all got skills that you think, actually, if I got asked in an interview, what are my top three skills or what are my top three strengths? We all kind of know off the top of our head what they are. Um, but it's about getting new knowledge and developing new skills. We're all learning here at Birkbeck because we didn't, you know, we want to continue learning and this whole term of lifelong learning um, is really sort of hot at the moment, but it's relevant, it's needed for the, for the careers that we're going to have over the next few decades. Um, it will get a foot in the door to your career. As I said, even if it's not in the exact industry you want, let's think outside the box a little bit. Um, and it will also enhance your employability opportunities. So think of what the position is you are in now for those of you who are working. And what I recommend you doing is actually making a list of, okay, what are your key skills that you are developing in that role? And how can they transfer to the career that you want? Because if you can identify that and it, you, it makes sense to you how you're going from A to B, then it's much easier for an employer to make sense of it as well, especially when you get to that interview process, but also the application phase, because your CV and your cover letter will flow a lot easier. It will it'll make more sense. So if you can recognise that now without having to sort of, you know, before you send the applications off, it will be a lot easier. Um, build your network. So if you are obviously uh, working in a role, you're studying as well, you've got your network at Birkbeck, but you've also got your network in your industry. So make connections, talk to those people that you haven't spoken to before or that haven't really crossed your paths because you never know who someone might know. Oh, I know someone who works in accounting. Oh, I know someone who works in events. I know someone who's in HR. And maybe they could introduce you and get some conversations going as well. Uh, broaden your experience, discover new opportunities. So look at things within your own place of work or in sort of future places of work in terms of what opportunities you can get involved with. Are there voluntary groups? Um, are there any sort of societies with not just within Birkbeck but within your own organisations that you can get involved with? Again, it's about broadening your experience and your knowledge as well while you're studying because while you're studying is a great opportunity to develop and then hopefully get that job you want at the end of it as well. Uh, demonstrate your commitment. So if you're working and studying, I mean, working 45 hours and studying full time is, is crazy um, and it is long, but it does show your commitment. Even if you're studying part time and working part time, it shows that you're committed to achieving that goal. And that is really huge for employers as well. And that, that's what Birkbeck does automatically. Um, but it's a great thing to talk about in your interviews. So just bear that in mind that we're a step ahead of the other universities as well. We might not be Imperial or Kings 
or Oxford or Cambridge, but we've got a really good stuff here, and especially for the, what it allows you to do and the flexibility, please make sure you're talking that up as well. Um, and make sure your work and study complement each other. Yes, you might be working in something completely different to what you're studying, but as I said, find the links, find those transferable skills, make it make sense to you and your narrative, so then for the employers it will help as well. So these are just some of the benefits of work and study, but it's just trying to get you thinking actually, what am I doing now and how can it help as well? So, some of you might be using online jobs boards to search for jobs. I know you said you're actively job hunting. What kind of tools are you using to search for jobs? Um, mainly online job boards like LinkedIn, um, yep. Indeed, or Read. Got it, yeah. awesome. Or e financial careers for, yep. for industrial specific jobs. And just by show of hands, who's on LinkedIn in the room? Da, da, da. So it's just so easy because you're in the middle, so it's just like everyone around you had their hands up. Um, I won't go on, I, don't, I do tend to always move all of my um, sort of courses and sessions onto LinkedIn. I'll try not to do that. It's just a recommendation of mine, whatever industry you are in. Um, I do recommend um, having a presence on there because it just allows you to open up to a new network. You don't need to have the best profile. If you don't even want any, I recommend having a picture on there because it looks professional, but you don't even have to have too much information on there. But if you have got a profile, it just means you can connect and find out about events, find out about job opportunities, um, connect with people who might be able to give you an introduction to someone in your industry as well. So it's just worth thinking about. That's all I'm saying. Um, sector specific websites. So you mentioned the e-financials, um, but if there are sort of specific websites, so when I was in hospitality, um, there was a particular agency that was quite specialised in hospitality management. So that was kind of where I went when I was at that part of my career. And also on the company pages. So if you've got an organisation or a handful of organisations, maybe there's about five that you think, I really want to work for those people, or they just look like they're doing some really cool stuff, I wonder if there's some opportunities, look directly on their website. So many people go straight for the jobs boards, which I understand, and they go for LinkedIn, but if you have got some in sort of industries or um, organisations in mind, nine times out of ten they'll have a careers section on their website. So look directly on there, see what's going on. If they haven't got roles that are suited to you, maybe they're all full-time roles, they're too many hours, um, or maybe it's not quite what you're looking for, normally they'll have a contact us section. So they have an email address for their careers uh, service um, or their recruitment team, and you can contact them directly. What, what's the worst that's gonna happen? That's often my motto is, one is just do it. So if you're thinking about doing something, do it, like applying to study, for example, setting up a LinkedIn page, just, just do it. Don't faff, um, don't procrastinate, just do it. Um, and the other one of my mottos that I like is, um, what's the worst that's gonna happen? Because if you send that email, the worst that's gonna happen is nothing happens. Or maybe they write back and say, I'm really sorry, you haven't got anything at the moment, but they'll normally say, well, keep your CV on file in case something else comes up. Don't rely on them that they'll keep their CV on file. Maybe six months down the line, you'll wanna give them a little nudge again. Me, I'm still here, you know, keep, keep in touch. But there it really is nothing, um, nothing bad that's gonna happen. It's only gonna be a no or a non-response. And that applies to LinkedIn as well. So I often connect with potential speakers to come to campus. That's kind of how I use LinkedIn quite a lot. Um, I work a lot with entrepreneurs in the enterprise program. So I reach out to them to see if they might want to collaborate in some way. The worst that's happened is that someone's come back and said, this year is just completely too busy for me, but keep me in mind for next year. And then maybe something's happened off the back of that, or they just haven't got back to me. But the best thing that's gonna happen is that they reply and say, oh, thank you so much, actually good timing. We're looking for someone to help out with X, Y, Z. Can't commit to a full-time role, but hey, 20 hours a week, ah, oh, bonus. Um, but yeah, just obviously it's not always gonna happen like that, but just put yourself out there a little bit more. And then offline re, um, sort of finding work and offline sort of searching, some of the things, they do take more time and it is a little bit more time consuming. Um, but I'll go to the middle one first and that's networking. So has anyone been to a networking event? Um, and I say networking event, but maybe an event with a keynote speaker and you've networked with people. Mm. Some nod nods of the head. You do need a few skills, I'll touch on them a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, so I go to events fairly regularly when I can, again, if there's opportunities to meet potential collaborators or speakers or just to learn something new. But if you go onto Eventbrite, LinkedIn, uh, a company, uh, a website called Meetups, anyone use Meetups? Meetups is great um, for sort of finding people who are in similar um, interest groups to you, whether that's professional or personal. Um, so you've got hobbies, uh, they've got gaming groups, coding groups, they've got social groups, 
singles in London groups, um, marketing groups, everything, everything you can imagine, meetups has it. So if you can look on there, if you're looking to broaden your network, most of them are evenings as well. Some of them do breakfast events, so you can probably work it around your studies as well. Um, but I really do recommend that. Yes, there is a certain skill set in there, but it's more, it's more just about, again, just going for it. It is about that confidence to start a conversation. We've all probably been to those events, some of them maybe at Birkbeck when you started, maybe external events where you walk in and there's tea and coffee on the side or there's a glass of wine or whatever it is and you've got everyone sort of chatting around these poser tables and you turn up on your own, you don't know anyone and you just go straight for the tea and coffee or the wine, you get that glass and then your phone comes out and you stand in the corner and you look really busy with your phone. Don't be that person. If you're going to go to an event, be the person that actually steps up and makes a conversation because again, what's the worst that's going to happen? Very, very rarely, if ever, would anyone turn around when you say, hi, can I join your conversation? W would you turn around and be like, no, and tell them to go away? Probably not. So other people won't either. So bear that in mind because, and have your sort of in conversations as well. The weather goes down really well in London and England in, January, in general. Uh, in general. Um, talk about maybe the speaker that's going to be talking, uh, maybe speak about, you know, why you're here, what brought you here to this event? Isn't this wine lovely? Anything, anything just to get that in and then you're in that conversation, you can start having those conversations as well. So yes, a certain skill, but I'd say the main thing is just having the confidence to go up to people because once you start those conversations, you're away. That's just the hardest part to do. Um, so think about that. Think about opportunities that you can network now that you're in. So at work, at Birkbeck, societies that you can get involved with, but also external. Use those websites and have a look at what's happening because um, you'll be surprised about how you can then build your network. When you do meet people, and if you are on LinkedIn, link, link in with them because you, you can build that as well. You can then follow them if they're in the industry. Say you want to work in HR. If they're in the HR industry, you can follow what they're doing. Um, there's definitely different groups on LinkedIn as well in terms of discussion groups. The CIPD have one if you're HR and learning and development. Um, so you can sort of tap into those. So just even if you just spend half an hour tonight or this week thinking, OK, how am I going to broaden my network? start my LinkedIn profile and just get going, you're one step ahead than you was this time next week, if you didn't do it. Um, referrals are a great way to get an in to a job. Um, it's really difficult, especially if you're international students and you've come over here to England, um, and maybe this, if this isn't your home country and you're not familiar with loads of you know, different people in different areas, but through those networks, you can then get referrals. You know, if you have a really fruitful conversation with someone at an event and you let them know about what you're looking for, make sure it's a two-way conversation. You know, make sure it's not just, hi, I'm Jenna, I'm looking to work in X, Y, Z. Who do you know in there? Can you help me? Make sure it's a two-way conversation. Um, but if you have those interesting conversations and they know what you're looking for, you never know. They might refer you to somewhere else or they might come back. And, and I've had it done many times for, oh, I know someone who talks on that topic or I know a potential entrepreneur who could do this. And that's how you then make those referrals. So don't sort of re disregard the offline time consuming ways because often the more effort you put in there, the more results you're going to get. Online, yes, you can send 50 CVs out and you get maybe nothing back. But if you work on tailoring your CV and your applications, and I won't go on, on this too much in terms of how, because we do a lot of that in careers on other um, opportunities, but don't just send out a, a, the generic CV to loads of different employers thinking, oh, I've sent 50, surely my chances of getting one back are at least going to happen. It might not. And I know plenty of people who have that approach and it just doesn't work. So if you are going for the online route, or even if it is offline and then someone's going to ask for your CV, tailor your CV to that role or at least tailor it to that organisation. So if, it's, if you're interested in, I talk about HR quite a lot, that's my other background as well, but if you're interested in HR or maybe you're interested in learning and development, but the role is for HR, don't just talk about learning and development, you need to start talking about the HR side as well. Or if you're interested in finance um, and maybe you've just applied for something very sort of curveball in management for a random company, you need to be tailoring it so they know that your passion is what they're doing and the role that they want to happen as well. So just bear that in mind. If you don't see a job that you want online, it doesn't mean that people aren't looking for people to hire. 85, I think the latest stat that I looked at with my colleague was about 85% of jobs are hidden, so they're not openly advertised on Reed or Monster or LinkedIn. LinkedIn normally they would be. Um, 
but often they do come from referrals, especially if you're working for a startup or a small to medium enterprise. Sometimes they do work on referrals because they want people with that sort of similar mindset or with that capability. And if someone says, I know this person, boom, they'll get snapped up. They might not actually recommend or put it out there online. So just bear that in mind um, as well. And there are curveballs um, opportunities as well. So I say curveballs because I've read about loads of different, I sort of follow different things that are happening in recruitment. Um, you might have heard of the person outside Waterloo Station who held a sandwich board and said, I'm looking for a job. And he was there every day for about two weeks. And then a manager of an organization turned up and offered him a job. Um, that doesn't normally happen. I wouldn't recommend doing a sandwich board outside Waterloo, but these are the curveballs that I mean. Uh, go knocking door to door. That's a very old school way of doing it. I'd avoid that if you can. You'd better off developing your network and building connections than sort of aimlessly handing out your CV in person as well. Um, but just bear that in mind. So some of the sort of top tips in terms of finding work, um, that's just some of the things that I wanted to share with you as well. Any questions off the back of that? Anything or any comments or anything like that? Any experiences that you've had that haven't worked or have worked that you're going through? Other thing is that recruitment agencies. It's yes. I don't know why I didn't put that on there. I think that's why I meant sex specific. It can um, be really helpful and can be also like zero. It's yeah. It really is. They're like not like Marmite, but it is either all or nothing with recruitment agencies. Often, um, I mentioned that I worked with one um, in the hospitality industry, but. That works, I think, because they were niche in that industry that I was trying to get into. They knew their industry really well, and it was a bespoke agency rather than this sort of big fat corporation. Um, agencies, yeah, some, and I did a session recently with the Economics and Finance Society, actually, and it's very similar. If you can get agencies that are quite niche in your area, then they will more often than not be more beneficial than sort of larger general organisations. I say that with a pinch of salt because some people have great experiences with the likes of Hayes, for example, because they do have desks that cover different industries, um, but definitely don't limit your job search to agencies. Have that as one factor in your wider careers uh, search and your job search. Um, ways to find agencies, Google's a delightful tool. Um, I say Google it far too much these days, but if you literally Google HR learning and development recruitment agencies, finance and economics recruitment agencies. Um, it might take you a little while to sort of do some digging, um, but have a look on there as well and see. But yeah, don't sort of hone in just on the agencies as well. But you will have good experiences and bad experiences. I don't want to say that they're all bad because they're not. And if you go on LinkedIn, just beware of the agencies. Uh, beware of the headhunters um, who have their interests at heart, not yours. Um, so just, yeah, just watch out for that. But LinkedIn is much, it's more positive than negative, but that's one thing you do need to watch out for on LinkedIn is that it's a recruiter's minefield. Um, they love it because they can find people that they want to recruit, but just bear that in mind. Any, any other comments? Yes. Uh, I'm not familiar, familiar with the difference between the intern job and part-time job. Okay, I can go through that, yeah, absolutely. So has anyone done an internship here before? Anyone done an internship or heard of internship? Uh, not here. So an internship, um, and I guess specifically for the UK, an internship uh, is usually paid. Um, you can get unpaid internships and there's a lot of sort of bad press about them, which they are quite bad press. I did do some unpaid internships when I graduated, and, but then I did journalism and it was a competitive industry, so it just depends on the industry that you're in. But more often than not now, it's paid internships and it's junior level positions and you use them to get that foot in the door to an organisation. So often we work a lot with small to medium enterprises or startups and they often recruit interns because it's low cost. Um, but it, gets, it kind of gets you to work each other out as well. So the intern can get a feel for the organisation, the organisation can get a feel for the intern. It doesn't always lead to a permanent position, but if you did perform well and they're looking for someone to fill that space, then you're much more likely to get that permanent position than if you applied externally and you didn't have that internship. But an internship is normally, I guess in terms of temporary, it could be a six week internship, it could be a one month internship, it could be six months, um, but usually they're less than a year. If they're more than a year, then that should be a full time or part time job, Not it shouldn't be classed as an internship. But it is really about a junior level position, supporting an organisation, gaining knowledge and skills, Whereas a part-time job, you are, you're fully employed by that organisation and you have a role to play. You're not 
sort of an intern which is classed as quite junior. If you're working part-time, you could be a senior manager or a senior executive and work part-time. It just means that you're doing less than 35 hours per week, which is the average full-time. I used to work about 50 hours a week as well, so average. Um, but yeah, so does that kind of make sense? So part-time part -time hours, less than 35 hours per week, so it could be four days a week, it could be three days a week, it could be 10 hours a week. Um, but an internship is much more about getting a foot in the door and working your way up from there in a career. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else? Um, I feel like you have so anything, yeah. just one of the norm that I've observed in the industry itself, um, it seems like regardless of going to agencies or direct um, company hires, it seems like the employers, they are not incentivized to hire international students for the fact that they need to go through the hassle of sponsoring. Yeah, that is that is a, bar a, a big barrier. Um, I worked in an organisation where we did sponsor some uh, individuals, but often they'd worked with us on their visa, for example, and then we wanted, uh, when their visas ran out, we then sponsored them as well. But yeah, it is a barrier. More employers now, bigger employers, are much more open and much more sort of keen, I guess, to, um, to sponsor. The smaller employers don't have as, as much resource or capacity to do it. Um, even though they might want to, it is, it is an extra hurdle. And unfortunately, that's out of your control and that's out of the employer's control because they've, we've got, they've got to go through these hurdles as well. My recommendation would be go for larger organisations. On their websites, they should say if they sponsor, um, but either way, there's no harm in applying for those positions because if they like you and they've got that ability in place, you'll know on the application form normally if they say, you know, you're an international student or do you, or do you work on a visa? because that will normally be part of the screening process. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a really horrible hurdle because employees do have to go through an extra, an extra thing for them. But I wouldn't say, don't let that put you off. I, but I would say, as a rule of thumb, the larger employers tend to have more opportunities for international students if you are on a visa or if they need to sponsor, for, especially for, for further work as well. Um, I can send you some links and things like that and more information on that because that might be helpful and I can include them on here as well. Um, but it's a really good point, especially for this session. Any other comments? Any other questions? If you've got other questions, then please feel free. We'll have some time at the end as well. Um, so just moving on now to some top tips, and I will, before we wrap up, um, go through how we can benefit you as well at Birkbeck and tapping into our resources. Um, but top tips, and I've just got some things here. Your CV, who has an up-to-date CV? Amazing. Um, Revisit your CV if you are, especially if you are about to job hunt or you are changing careers, then revisit your CV at least once a year normally or if you get a new job because only you know what you're doing in that position and if you can get that on your CV sooner rather than later um, before you've left that position, that's ideal. We can help quite a lot on your CVs. Um, we've got loads of online resources through our online careers portal, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, and we have a drop-in service at the Student Central building as well. Um, but Definitely update your CV if you haven't already. Top tips for CVs, just for really key sort of takeaways, because I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but have a professional profile paragraph at the top of your CV. So five or six lines, um, not really any more than that, but it just needs to be a quite a short, sharp, punchy introduction to who you are and what you're looking for. So who you are would be, I'm a I don't know, ambitious, motivated, dedicated, HR professional looking to expand my professional possibilities or opportunities, da, 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 da. Um, but make sure you've got a little bit in there about your key strengths, who you are and what you're looking for. The point of it is just to make sure the employer reading your CV actually reads it and says, ah, I get it. I get why they're applying for this position. I want to read on and find out more. If you don't have a profile, they're not, not going to read your CV, but it just adds a lot of weight to it and it gets you a good introduction as well. Um, have key skills on there. This is something that a lot of people don't have and it's a missed opportunity. It um, doesn't have to be right at the top of your CV, but if you just have a few key skills, again, four or five, um, that highlights what your top three skills are, for example. Language skills can go on there, that's great. Technical skills, any techie knowledge, if you code, um, if you have particular software that the industry you're going for is going to be helpful. Um, a lot of the skills, I guess, in terms of transferable skills that go a long way are things like leadership. So if you've led a team or if you've been responsible for looking after interns or supervising people, 
innovation and creativity, if you've had an impact in coming up with new ideas for projects or ways of working, and that can you can really be quite creative in different ways in your role, so just think about that. Um, collaboration, another fancy word for team working, but collaboration sounds a bit more funky. Um, so be, the ability to collaborate with people, but also work independently, working under pressure. Um, just look at the job description of what you're applying for and try and see where your top skills come in. It's not to say you copy the, the desired skills from the job description onto your CV, because you might not have those top skills, but there'll be some in there that you can sort of interpret and reiterate as well. But yeah, so personal profile, key skills section, um, and highlight your achievements on your experience section, more so than your responsibilities. So often what a lot of people do on their work experience section, they'll say, HR advisor for 2E travel, whatever it might be, and they list a ream of bullet points and it just says what they did. It doesn't say what they achieved. If I, I, I know what a HR advisor does at a big organisation really. Most, you know, you can kind of find out that out online. What I don't know about this person is what did they achieve and what value did they add to that organisation. So that's what's going to make you stand out. If you can get some stats in there, fantastic. Um, if you can talk about the impact you had on particular projects, training new staff members, leading new different opportunities, developing customer service skills, did you have mystery shoppers or were you recognised for sales or whatever it might be. There's all different things you can think about but just be a bit more savvy and achievement focused rather than responsibilities. Um, going down here LinkedIn, if you're not on there already, I highly recommend it. Um, and you, there's ways online to boost your profile. So if you are on there, great. Are you making the most of it? Are you maximising the opportunity? Um, have a look. LinkedIn have their own set of sort of tips and tricks to get a good profile. Um, but just have a look on there and use it. Don't just let it sit there. You know, if you can, at once a day, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn at least, if not a bit more than that because it's on the app on the phone. But if you can, just once a day, see what's happening, start liking, sharing articles, um, and just looking at the jobs opportunities on there, it'll go a long way. Uh, who's heard of the elevator pitch or the term elevator pitch? Yeah, some of you, some of you. The idea of an elevator pitch, and that's why it looks like it's the top of an elevator up there, is if you were stuck in a lift with someone, or not even stuck in a lift, sorry, it's not broken down. You've got in a lift, someone else got in a lift, it's just the two of you, and you're going up to, say, the 10th floor. A bit awkward sometimes, but say that person asked you, so what do you do? So tell me a bit about yourself. And that's about, what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, to sort of tell them a bit about yourself. That's the premise of an elevator pitch. You don't just use it in elevators or lifts, um, but it's the premise of it. If you've got 30 seconds to basically tell people what you do or who you are, how are you going to use that 30 seconds? And that's really key for networking opportunities. It's great for the profile sections of your CV, for your um, descriptions on LinkedIn. Uh, when you're in interviews, normally, how many people have been in an interview and it, it starts, tell me a bit about yourself, mm. or tell me a bit about who you are, kind of. A lot of people do that in the UK as well. It just kind of breaks the ice in terms of the interview as well. But they don't want you to tell them your career history or your life story. They want you to be quite succinct with it and be quite powerful. So 30 seconds doesn't sound a lot, but you can get some really good stuff in there. So again, Google's a great tool. We've got some on online resources that you can use as well to develop a good elevator pitch. But just think about that. How, if you had to present yourself in 30 seconds, what would that look like? Okay, you can practice on each other after the session. Um, network, this is sort of my image for networking. Build your network, again, top tips and use the job descriptions. So if you're going for a particular position, and maybe there isn't a job out there that you sort of you've seen, but look at job descriptions that are similar to the roles that you're going for, so you can get an idea of what are they looking for. Do the same skills keep coming up? Does the same type of experience keep coming up? And are there ways that you can start developing those skills now, so that when you do apply for those particular roles, you can work on that as well? So use job descriptions to your benefit. Um, use the company websites, so if you are applying for a particular organisation, look at things like their brand values, look at their vision, mission statements, vision, mi vision mission, values, something like that, that, their statements that they abide by, look at their Twitter, you know, what kind of things are they posting, have they got any new projects, all this kind of stuff that's really going to help you with um, finding the work that you want, not just, you know, the jobs of hospitality and retail that a lot of people end up in as well. But that's all hopefully some top tips to go by. Um, anyone else got any sort of either tips or things that you, any questions that you've got in terms of looking for work in your industries or any top tips that you thought actually this did work for me or anything that you want to share with the group? 
So I know it's not, not just me that's got these experiences. No, have a think. Um, we'll come back to it, but these are just a couple of things. To, these are kind of like the key takeaways, I guess. Um, I want to spend sort of the next part of the session in terms of your learning experience and what we can do for you at Birkbeck um, before we sort of have another sort of group discussion before we wrap up for Q&A. Um, is anyone part of a society or a group here at Birkbeck? Anyone tapped into it? Extracurricular courses? Anyone on the Pioneer programme? Maybe. Um, so some of you are great. So have a look at what else is out there for Birkbeck. So we're, we're an untraditional university, going back to what I said right at the very start. We're evening study. It's very different to sort of the traditional daytime study. This gives you an, a massive range and an advantage in terms of what else you can get involved with. But look at what's on your doorstep for now and see where you can develop. So uh, on campus activities, so these could be events that we run, shameless plug for the careers team, but we do a lot of different events and activities. The Students Union, look at different societies or clubs that you might want to get involved with. Events within your department, so sometimes there's key like guest lectures um, or other events that they might promote, whether they're at, at Birkbeck on campus or external, so have a look at other opportunities. Um, different workshops that are taking place, uh, free digital courses. Um, you guys as Birkbeck students have got access to a platform called Linda lynda.com there's a few nods fantastic if you haven't already tapped into it just look on the uh, the part of the Birkbeck page um, website that says Linda you can just search for it um, you can then access a range of online courses historically Linda used to be quite tech heavy so it used to be like coding courses technical courses but now it's branched out much more into sort of general business uh, development you can work on Excel skills management skills leadership skills um, emotional intelligence, all those kind of things. So have a look on lynda.com and also the online careers portal. I'll give you the, the way to get into that as well. Um, bespoke online career development programs. So we run a lot of different programs uh, within the careers team, but also within your school. So just tap in, just have a look. Again, it be half an hour sitting down and just exploring what's out there. If you go to the events section of the Birkbeck website, I guarantee there'll be something for everyone within the next couple of weeks. And normally they're on weekday evenings, some of them will be daytime, some will be weekends. So we do try and move it around a little bit because we know there's gonna be some clashes with lectures as well. But the main thing there is push yourself outside your comfort zone. Again, if there's something you're thinking about doing, do it. If there's something you think, what is that that's gonna hold you back from doing it? So just take that plunge, take that risk and do it as well. If it's sending that email with that CV, if it's sending that message on LinkedIn, if it's signing up for that meetup and going along and being the only person that you know you don't know anyone else but you go along to it just try and get outside your comfort zone and try new things because the more you do that the more people you're going to meet the more opportunities you're going to discover rather than not getting involved so that would be my top tips um, different examples or again carrying on from the top tips I guess um, some of the things you're going to come across is things like customer service administration team roles where if you put in part-time opportunities, yes, maybe some people will come up with this. But when I say be quite savvy with your job search, what I mean is be, be quite open. If you see that there's a full-time job available that you know you're great for and you, you think you could do it, reach out to the employer. Go onto that employer's website, get the information and the contact of that in person, attach your CV and just send a short note to say, I'm really interested in this particular uh, program. I'm currently studying towards my degree in XYZ. Um, however, I know I'm going to be a great fit for this opportunity. I wondered if you'd consider a part-time position. What's the worst that's going to happen? They're not going to come back to you or they're going to say no. Um, but that's what I mean in terms of be quite savvy with it. If there are opportunities in customer service or reception roles or whatever it might be, but it's not, it's not the role you want, but it's the sector that you want, consider those things as well. Consider just getting that foot in the door, especially if you're a career changer and you just want, you want a job alongside your studies, nothing too strenuous, maybe you're hands on. Um, it's completely up to you in terms of what your um, sort of priorities are. But that's a great way as well if you are changing careers completely because then you're, you're front facing. If it's a reception or admin role, you kind of get the jobs where you kind of see everything that's going on. You're not going to be in a really senior position where you've got loads of responsibility on your head. You can still leave at five to get here for six for your studies. But just think about that. Look at ways to get into that industry. If that's really your focus and you're struggling, then start somewhere <coughs> rather than just aiming for the top. I always say aim high, always. But if it's an opportunity for you to get into the industry you want, 
then have a look at other opportunities you might not have thought of. But if you're, if you're in, the, in there, then you can build your network in that industry as well. Uh, play to your strengths as much as possible. So don't go for something that is completely different to what you're, not necessarily what you're doing now, but are really far away from the skills that you've learned. You learn that skill set before you then go to that for that opportunity. Um, explore different sectors, as I've said. Is there opportunity where you can develop really core skills and knowledge that you can then work towards otherwise? Ask around. Use this network. We're all international students. Um, have a chat with each other. Talk to each other at the end of the session. We've got this room till five and I'm going to be wrapping up soon. Um, so just, you know, have a chat because you never know what's out there. Uh, people are working, people aren't working, people know people. Um, so just start asking around in your lectures, in your seminars, the networking events you're going to go to. Uh, voluntary opportunities, I put this in there at the bottom because it depends on what, again, depends on your priorities. I volunteer for a charity, but it's very ad hoc, so I can kind of tap in as much or as little as I want. And that's a great opportunity to develop some skills that I wanted to develop, open up a network, but also give something back and do something good. Um, but look at those opportunities that are going to develop that skill set or opportunities that, again, it's going to open another network for you. So uh, that would also look really good on your CV. Um, it could open up people who know people in another area, because often people who volunteer in charities are working full time or part time in other companies, and they're just using that time to give back. So it's worth thinking about that, not just for the benefit of the charity you're working for, but for the benefit of you and your personal development as well. So have a look there. There's an organisation called Volo, V-O-L-O, -O, um, which is a platform that we're working with quite closely this year, um, which advertise different voluntary opportunities. But they make sure that it's meaningful voluntary opportunities because it's linked to your career. So their motto is like, volunteer for your career. It rhymes. Um, but that's what they use. And you can develop an online profile with them and you go from there as well. So all these things, I'm not even really scratching the surface of the opportunities that you can get involved with but it's just some ideas to go away with to think, okay, have I thought about this angle? Have I thought about this approach in terms of my work as well? So um, don't forget that we're here to help. So I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot of what we do. Has anyone been to any of our career sessions other than today? Any careers workshops? Yeah, what ones have you been to? It was one of the first ones back in September. It was also for uh, international students. Oh, okay. Or maybe just for new students, I'm not sure. Was it me? <laughs> come back fantastic um, so that was a great one uh, good chat good chat um, so yeah so there are other opportunities for, for in the international students that Andrea would obviously promote to you guys um, have a look on Eventbrite under so if you go onto the Burtbeck website it's probably the easiest place to start and go onto the careers section because when it says events that will link directly to our Eventbrite page and it will show you different opportunities that we've coming up so we're doing things like emotional intelligence positivity and confidence online tools for your career um, loads of sort of different stuff, but also employer-led events. So we had a guy who used to work at Google come in a couple of weeks ago talking about digital marketing and your personal branding. Uh, we have got MasterCard coming in in term two. Um, I can't remember what that's exactly on, but something about their programs that they run as well. So tap into the careers events and the enterprise events as well. So. Um, if you've heard of Enterprise Pathways, yes. Um, if you haven't, I'm telling you now, so you can register. Um, but on your My Burtbet profile, you've probably been to the Manage tab, and it's My Privacy Controls, and you can tick what you want to tap into and tap out of. There should be a box on there that says Enterprise Pathways. So it's not just Enterprise suggests that you want to work for yourself or that you're entrepreneurial. It's not just for people who want to build a business. Um, obviously, if you have got visa restrictions, you'll know as an international student, you can't set up a business on that visa. You need to get an entrepreneur's visa. Um, but it's about developing the entrepreneurial skills like pitching, uh, leadership, the innovation and creativity piece, uh, funding, marketing, branding, all of those kind of things that are gonna help whether you're working for an organization or whether you're working for yourself. So there's a term called intrapreneurship, um, which is about almost being an entrepreneur and a pioneer in your organization and sort of really spearheading different projects as well. And that's what we help out with as well as entrepreneurs. So tap into that. But bet talent I'm gonna talk about in a moment, um, but basically a snapshot of what we do. So we've got the careers portal. Who's used the careers portal? Not all of you. Who has no idea what the careers portal is? 
Okay, cool. Um, so the careers portal is via your accessible via your MyBirthBet profile. So when you log into your MyBirthBet profile, about halfway down the home page, there should be a little box that says careers and employability. If you click that, that will go directly to your online careers portal, which looks something like this on the home page. So you've got bespoke um, sort of modules, if you like, uh, that we've developed from careers, from the enterprise program, from the upskill program that we run. Um, but you've also got, so it's cut off a little bit, but this one here is about employment and career development. So if you click on that, you'll have access to CV templates, you'll have access to employer interviews saying what they're looking for from applications. You can simulate interviews, you can get tips on assessment centres, job hunting, loads of different stuff. So if you haven't tapped into that already and you are, you're here because you want to develop careers, work around your study, then I recommend that as your first port of call. Um, the next thing, oh, and Linda's there as well. So Linda.com I mentioned earlier, but that's accessible um, via your Burt Beck, the Burt Beck website. Uh, the career space, some of you might have been to the career space already, but this is in the Student Central building. So if you've used the Student Union, it's the same building as the Student Union on Mallet Street. But as you go in, just to the right of the reception desk, we've got our new career space this year. Um, looks a little bit like that. Um, except we've got new branding now. But that's open every weekday afternoon um, and you don't need an appointment to go and see a careers advisor. So if you're a current student or if even when you graduate, you can tap into this service as well. So it's two till six, Monday to Thursday, one till five on a Friday. And it's just, you get about 10 to 15 minutes with an advisor. So it might be that you're, you've got an application that you wanna hand in tomorrow and you pop there today by six and you take your CV, you take the job application, you say, look, I'm applying for this tomorrow. I don't really know where else to go with it. Can you just give me some tips? And they'll give you some tips on how to do that application. Similarly, if you've got an interview, um, take along the job description and we can do a like, mini sort of advice on how to prepare for the interview. But you get about 10 to 15 minutes, um, but it's first come, first serve, but it's not normally too busy. So use that if you can. Um, Upskill, I mentioned about the event side. So this is all employer-led events. So if you're looking to get into certain industries and there's an employer coming on board from the industry you want to get into, so we had PwC recently uh, come in. So a lot of students who want to work for PwC, it's understandable, they're a big company, came in, obviously sat through the session very politely, but then went straight up to the people uh, at the end and either gave them the business card or had a chat with them and took their email address so they could follow up and see what opportunities they might have. Things like that, just being quite savvy with the events that you've got and being that person that annoys that speaker at the end and says, right, this is, this is me, this is what I'm looking to get into. Have you got advice? Or can I take an email address that I can follow up with you? Or even better, are you on LinkedIn? Most people will rather you link in with them and send a message on there than necessarily give their email out as well. Um, but I recommend tapping into Upskill if you can, if you're interested in either career changing or getting into a, an organisation. Uh, enterprise I've mentioned, so yes, if you've got a business idea but you just want to develop entrepreneurial skills, tap into that. Um, and Burt Beck Talent, so this is the main one for you guys, especially here today, looking for a new role, looking to transition careers. Talent is literally your recruitment agency, so we talk about bad agencies. Talent's a good agency. Um, I don't directly work with the talent, well I work with the talent team but I'm not um, a talent consultant, but we work really closely together because if you're registered with Burt Bet Talent and you're applying for jobs and getting interviews with the employers they're working with, we obviously want to help you out as much as possible. So we tend to do mock interviews with you. Uh, we do one-to-ones with you to help with your applications and things like that. But they work with a load of different organisations. It's not just one or the other. Yes, there do seem to be quite a lot of tech roles coming up, especially because it's uh, small to medium businesses looking for tech support. Um, but we've placed people in management consultancy roles, HR roles, finance roles, accountancy roles, um, psychology, media, sales, marketing, whatever it might be. And the best thing is that you can filter by part-time or full-time. So you can talk to talent and they're only at the other end of the line and you can say, look, obviously, yeah, I'm an international student, up to 20 hours per week, what opportunities do you have for me? They could then also be that person that says, look, I've got this student who's really interested in this role. You're advertising it as full time. Would you consider part time or 20 hours? Use them to be your consultant because that's what they're there for as well. Um, and these are just some of the employees that they've worked with. Um, literally a snapshot. Did anyone come to the careers fair? 
uh, in September. Some of you might have nodded. There's other careers fairs that take place all the time as well. So look at the London Careers Fair, University of London do one. Uh, look at general ones that they might have, the Student Careers Fair, I think in, oh, not King's Cross, um, Angel near that business centre. Um, they sometimes have one as well. But again, use Eventbrite, use meetups and use LinkedIn to search for the events that you want to go into. Um, but I definitely, if you haven't already, you can register with Birkbeck Talent. Again, it goes back to your My Birkbeck profile. Um, as you sign in on the homepage, it will be there. I think the application or the registration process is just to upload your CV and then one of the consultants will call you and arrange that for you as well. But I do, it's on your doorstep, especially if you, you're limited in terms of the number of hours, you can be quite specific with them. Say, this is what I can do. If there are opportunities in this sector, let me know. Go back to what I said about agencies though, don't just use talent as your main job search because they don't have something for everyone all the time. It really does depend, but there is a jobs board as well. But just make sure that's part of your job search process as well. Um, I'll share these details just so you've got all of our contact details, but we've split it just to try and make it really easy for you to direct your query to the right people. Um, but please do get in touch with us if you want to. We've got time for Q&A. Um, I know I've given you sort of a whirlwind tour of tips, advice, examples and things like that. But just wanted to open it out to you guys now to see if you had any questions um, about anything that I've spoken about or the support that we can give you at Birkbeck. It's always that awkward silence. Is everyone good? Is that quite helpful-ish? So I'll share these with Andrea so she can send them over to you as well. I'll hang around here for a little bit, so if you have got questions, let me know. But also have a chat with each other if you can. Um, you know, you've got loads of different international events. Andrea does an awesome job of giving you a year's supply of different activities. So do make sure you go to those because you're, you're going to build, build a network between you guys as well. Um, but just tap into us as much as you can, and we are here to help wherever we can. Good luck, guys. Cool. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.